Hey, this is Pamela Riemenschneider. I'm the retail editor for Blue Book Services, and this is the Produce Reporter Week in Review. Greg, you've got your team. I got mine. <laughs> we each have our teams, but we're recording this before our game, so when people watch this, they'll know what it, what will have happened. If if my Chiefs held on at home, unlike last season, if your Rouse Raiders won a big JV match. Yeah, hopefully it's our it's our uh, primary rival, the purple cult of liberty hill um <laughs> we'll see how it happens <laughs> the chiefs have a purple cult too it's the ravens oh see look at us <coughs> we got something in common here, here um go. let's see this week's news rundown we're talking about football what has been the football food what has established itself as the football food over the last couple of years um and it, it's uh we're kicking off <laughs> kicking off <laughs> um this the, the season of promotions with with um avocados and football and uh it looks like uh things are getting off to a, a really strong start here I, yeah i was thinking um we haven't really talked about avocados a whole lot because it hasn't been football season <laughs> and now it's football season again and uh just we had a few reminders. I mean, it kind of kicked off the week with the avocados from Mexico announcing that they were re-upping their promotion where they're sponsoring the college football playoff, which is is uh, expanded this year. Um, yeah, come December and January, anyone who liked football is going to be in football heaven because you've got like every other day there's a college football playoff game or an NFL football playoff game. So football fans are going to be nuts. You so you got to have your avocados when you got your watch parties going. Absolutely, right. And uh, you know, I thought we I thought it was really interesting. And just to put avocados in perspective, and just to think about how many avocados we are eating in the United States. Marco had a story this week talking about Mexican avocado imports, and um, we're expected to import what two point seven billion with a B. Um, was that pounds or dollars or dollars worth? Yeah. Yeah. And that is an increase. Like we have tripled in the United States, our avocado consumption since 2001. Um, and I, I can, I've always, I've been, I, I was an early adopter of avocados. I was eating them when I was a kid. I can remember Ponax in, in, uh, in downtown Kansas city off of Southwest Boulevard, the guacamole made there, that that's kind of a core memory for me for childhood, but many, many it, avocados were so unfamiliar when I was a kid that I took them as show and tell in third grade to school. Um, <laughs> I was showing people how to make guacamole um, with underripe avocados that I had bought at consumers in Osage Beach, Missouri. It was, it, it didn't work out so well, but it was my early career of showing you how to do things in the kitchen. Did you show them how to cut it without cutting your hand? Yes, you know what though? My sister has had avocado in three times. Um that required a hospital trip. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but uh what I also thought was interesting is that avocados and football go so well together. Um, but we saw Haas Avocado Board also had so they released their, you know, period periodic reports and the promoted percentage lift in volume. For large avocados for Cinco de Mayo was outrageous this year. It was 73%. Um, and then they also mentioned that bagged avocados are performing way better um, than some of the other promotions that they've got out there. And it really made sense to me because when I think about innovative retailers, I try not to go to my homer all the time. Um, but HEB does some really cool stuff with where you'll the, the little yellow coupons that are all over the store and there'll be a bag of avocados and then you get all this other stuff free. So bagged avocados really present a lot of interesting opportunities and then also just volume movement. Um, so it makes sense. Yeah, it's the number one uh, product at Trader Joe's, right? Teeny tiny avocados. Teeny tiny avocados. Those are bagged avocados as well. Um, I've seen a couple of other retailers try to try to move those tiny avocados at, to whatever success. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think Trader Joe's has the market cornered on catchy names for things sometimes. <laughs> um, but small avocados have their place. You just want to have, you know, one person 
Uh, but in my house, the the big ones are winning. Well, the, yeah, the the big ones are hard for a single person to eat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then a I lot can't of tell avocado. You how many... It's like one of those giant apples. It's like that one is too much. You know what I saw? An, I saw an AI photo earlier this week of a guy that allegedly in Japan grew the world's largest apple, and and it was like his hands were it. It was like this, the picture. So they were using perspective and then it was AI um, but manipulated to make it look massive. But yeah, it just kind of made, reminded me of the one time that I bought a pizzazz apple when they were brand new to the market. So it's usually like large fruit kicking off of trees and it was bigger than my younger son's head. Um, so sometimes those apples, you know. Well, your kid's grown, so that's probably not the case anymore. Right. You know what else is growing? Aldi. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to put this into perspective because we saw a news release this week about an Aldi hiring event. And normally with retailers, I kind of like, I don't really run the the news releases about hiring events, but let's talk about the numbers of it. 13,000 um, store and warehouse employees that they're planning on hiring and that's on top of their 49,000. So percent wise, that is, that is huge. That's uh, what? More than 25%. More than four. Yeah. I was going to say it's about 20%, 25%. Um, so if I think if I put that in perspective, uh, I think like four or five store employees are at a, an Aldi at any given time. And so that means one more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's warehouse employees too. So don't get too excited about having, you know, one other person working the Aldi store, <laughs> but it also, I, 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 this made me curious, right? So I, I was wondering, so Aldi with what's their boilerplate say they, that like 2000 some odd stores, right? <clears throat> They're planning to add 800 more stores is what they, they announced back in March. Um, but if you compare that to a regular store i'm not talking about dollar general because i bet you dollar general is way lower um i i looked it up and kroger with what three thousand stores has four hundred thousand employees um and 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 here's one that i i just looked up as well heb has 430 stores and about forty thousand employees so if we want to wonder how Aldi is able to maintain their super low prices. It's it's labor. It 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 is. It's got to be. That's got to be what the, the biggest piece of the puzzle for them. Low low store overhead because it's a small box. Yeah. Um. They don't hold on to a lot of uh, uh stock in the back. Uh, they do just in time for a lot of their deliveries, and then they only have a couple of people working in that box. Yeah. Well, they don't have a bakery. They don't have a deli. They increasingly don't have checkout lanes. It's, it's increasingly moving to self check. So to whatever yeah, success, it's a, it's a different store experience. Yeah, it's definitely a different store experience. Although I've <clears throat> I've seen some Aldi stores um, toy with the idea because if you go in, to Germany or uh, Switzerland or somewhere like that where they you know, are based. They're a, a German company, of course. Um, they do have bakeries in in the Aldi's there. Um, but it's clear that they've kind of like puzzled out the US market and thought, eh, you know what? I'm not sure that we need those here. Although I'm waiting to hear back from our good friend Anne Marie about whether or not, you know, what this new Win Dixie to Aldi conversion looks like because I want to see some pictures. I want to know what's going on in there. Um, and she lives in an area that they've already had one of the store conversions. So we'll see what this employee count looks like in a Winn-Dixie box that's been converted to an Aldi. Yeah, we're still very much in the dark on that. I, I would be interested to see, too. Maybe one of us can travel to Florida soon. Maybe, maybe. Um, I don't know when I'll be in Florida next. <laughs> like... We got a battle over SEPC in March. Right. Yeah, I, I will be in SEPC in Nashville next week. Um, unfortunately, there will be no Winn-Dixie to Aldi conversions there to go scope out, but maybe I'll just have to hit up my Florida friends in the meantime. Um, what else do we have? 
We had a lot of acquisitions again this week. Uh, we saw Natalie's Orchid, 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 sorry, Orchid Island Juice Company um, acquired by a West Coast uh, citrus firm. So that was really interesting. Um, we've got uh, the bankruptcy for uh, what are you, Red Lobster. Red Lobster's bankruptcy was approved. Um, and then... I've been keeping an eye on it and I kind of put a digest together of what's going on with BC tree fruit because uh, there were the growers, they did a petition to try to save the BC tree fruit. Um, they, they petitioned 10 members of the Canadian government, both provincial and national government folks to try to find a way to keep the packing house open for, or for this season to get just, get somebody to come in and step in and take over just so they can harvest this year's crop and get it sold and then figure it out after there. Um, but that was unsuccessful. And uh, they did an online auction of all of the assets that was open from August 28th to September 4th. Um, so that was unsuccessful. The government response was a kind of unhelpful list of here are some other packing houses that you can try to call up and see if they can help you out. Oh, not only that, but uh, they also said, here's the tree fruit climate resiliency program. If you're interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, and, <laughs> and you know, in their defense, like the British Columbia, the BC fruit growers association did put out a, a statement on that, thanking them for, you know, a, a couple of crumbs to help out what's going on there. It's just, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of inside knowledge of what's going on in BC. I know that they've had a lot of bad crops over the last couple of years, um, but there's a lot of podcasts out there. There's a lot of alternative media outlets out there talking about what's going on with uh, what happened with BC tree fruits. Um, the growers were not happy with some of the management decisions. It was a whole mess and a whole mess that ended abruptly and is basically leaving growers holding apples on the tree um, with no bins to put them in. You would hope there could be a, a kind of a conclusion that it was similar to what happened with Primo Wawona in California. I mean, someone else, several other companies took it over and they're putting that fruit out in the marketplace. And because it was allegedly mismanaged so badly it's i mean i've gotten moonlight fruit in kansas city from california all summer and it's been very good yeah i mean it's a it's we're we're somebody's gonna buy these apples presumably um, you would hope. it doesn't seem hope. to fit the climate resiliency strategy <clears throat> to just pile them all under no so but i trees and let them drop I did see um, one one uh, media outlet was talking about just how bad the crops have been over the last couple of years out there. Some of it was a 90% crop loss in some of the fruit crops in British Columbia. Remember, they had the atmospheric wave, um, the, the the rains that never stopped raining, uh, and, and a lot of the, they're even calling it a tender fruit catastrophe as the final tipping point. Um, the some of the, some of the language is a is a little flashier than we would use. <laughs> Sounds more but, British tabloid than than Canadian. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it, it just kind of makes you wonder what's going to be <laughs> happening with what's going on out there. Um, who's going to pick that up and what that's going to do to the market because i mean british columbia apples do make it into the u.s market um and they, they're they have been a major marketing force bc tree fruit has been around for 90 years hasn't it or even more than that um kind of been a backbone of uh big names in canada and so it it, it will be interesting to see what happens what the fallout of that is yeah um that that's something we can look into because their their cherry their cherry crop I mean that was July August mm -hmm. so that would have been that would have been over and I know a lot of that stays local in, throughout Canada because um, the U S exports to Canada early season but then once there's Canadian fruit the U S suppliers are pretty much out of that 
Right, right. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on it. And if anyone's got some insider info, you hit me up. <laughs> I want to know what's going on. I'm curious. Um, so we covered we covered BC. We covered the Midwest. We got made it all down to Florida. Uh, we got Mexico. I'd, I'd say we were pretty geographically complete on this week in review. Yeah, the only thing we're missing is New York. What's happening up there? <laughs> Oh, you know what? Actually, there was something that was really cool that came out of the U.S. Open that I saw on LinkedIn um, was something that Baldor did with uh, melon balls. Uh, one of the signature drinks that they were uh, serving at the U.S. Open had a very specific kind of melon um, in it. And I what was it, like 150,000 pounds of those melons that they used for that that one drink? Um, it made it into Good Morning America's coverage. Um, I thought it was really interesting. And not surprising is for uh, an organization like Baldor. I mean, they've been known for doing some innovative promotions and programs there. So there we go. And we've got now we've got our Northeast angle right. out of this week we can review. I can't remember what kind of melon it was, but I do remember it was Greg Goose Vodka. <laughs> and there are two two American <laughs> men in the semifinals playing each other, which means they'll be an American finalist. So American tennis fans will get a finalist in a major for the first time in 15 years since Andy Roddick. He's been retired and we can, for a decade. And we can wrap up this week's Week in Review with tennis instead of football how, and soccer. How about that? How about that? All right, well, that's it for the Produce Reporter Week in Review. If you are not getting the Produce Reporter newsletter, you need to go to produceBluebook.com and sign up. Mm -hmm.